Um, it's terrific to see everyone's number showing up as we've got well over 170 participants this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Matt Wagoner. I'm the Information Specialist Statewide Lead. Stacy, introduce yourself. All right, can you hear me? Hmm. I am Stacy Bond. I'm an Information Specialist and I am located in the Springfield office. We, uh, we really appreciate everyone participating today. Our webinar, the presentation itself shouldn't take a long time, um, which will leave us some time to answer questions because I'm sure that, that there will be lots and lots of questions. So what's changing? So as of December 1st, uh, 2021, the information specialists officially started providing centralized coordination of the guardianship request process for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Um, so, as part of the organizational efficiency process that took place, it started in, gosh, la well, earlier this year, um, we looked at different functions within the information specialist system uh, and uh, determined that it m might be more conducive to centralize the guardianship coordination process. The decision to absorb those duties uh, was not based upon uh, any issue or problem. The, the process was being done very well and the individuals that were performing it were doing a great job. It really just came down to the process of centralization and um, overall supervision. Okay. And this is just a reminder that obviously the division is not involved with every single guardianship for all of the clients. Uh, individuals and families often pay for their own guardianships, their legal counsel, and then if they cannot afford it, they can always try legal aid. In fact, uh, general counsel has recently been pushing to have them apply through legal aid before applying through DMH. Um, and there was a lot of them a couple of years ago getting approved and legal aid was assisting. That kind of dropped off for some reason when COVID hit, but uh, hopefully they'll get back to being able to assist a few more people. And then uh, the division can help with guardianships when there's insufficient resources. So that's one of the things that uh, we're gonna also need to push back a little bit on and get a little more proof of is the, um, the the resources for the individuals that are applying. We need to make sure that um, they weren't able to get assistance anywhere else and have to show the, the need for financial assistance for legal. And uh, basically this just means that DMH is to be the option of last resort. Great. And just a note, we we'll typically lean on general counsel to make the final decision on financial need. Um, and let them determine that process and, and what that means. Um, that's not a decision that we will make as guardianship coordinators. Um, so the biggest change that we wanna talk about this morning is that prior to December 1st, guardianship packets were handled on a regional basis. Um, each regional office typically had its own guardianship coordinator and those were submitted regionally. We're transitioning that process away from a regional submission of guardianship packets and exhibit packets, as well as just questions and a, a requests for technical assistance. Uh, the new process as of December 1st is that there is an email um, address that we're gonna request that all exhibit packets be submitted through and that questions or requests for technical assistance be submitted there as well. Uh, any question surrounding guardianship regarding the division, we're gonna ask that that be submitted to ddguardianship at dmh.mo.gov. And the way that you see it typed there is the way that it needs to be entered into the address bar. Um, so that would be for submitting guardianship exhibit packets, but also asking questions, requesting technical assistance, anything when in doubt, submit an email to the guardianship, um, ddguardianshipdmh.mo.gov. Uh, um, once that's 
those are submitted in the inbox. We're going to monitor those um, myself uh, and then some other individuals within the information specialist so that we have some redundancy in place. We'll have access to the email box and those will get assigned out to the information specialists across the state. So you may reside in, in, in Columbia or through central Missouri, but you may work with Stacy who is in um, Springfield. So as the overall division information specialist um, handles things on a statewide basis, that's how we're going to handle guardianship. Uh, one email box submitted and then we'll go from there. It will be then assigned out to uh, one of our information specialists and now guardianship coordinators who will be in touch um, to talk through the process, assist in technical assistance and things like that. Matt, is it okay if I remind everybody that we're not allowed to give legal advice? I think that that would be great, Stacy. Please remind people that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just uh, sometimes I get questions that kind of border on uh, whether or not it's legal advice, and so I just wanted to remind everybody when submitting questions to the the email address that uh, we can't give legal advice. We're happy to answer questions that we can, and we can you know look things up and help you out. But as far as legal advice goes, yeah. we can't give that. I think Office of General Counsel would appreciate it if we did not. <laughs> you know, offer legal advice. We have no legal training. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this next slide is just a quick reminder that um, guardianship is considered to be the most restrictive alternative, uh, and it does involve taking away an individual's right to choice. So it needs to be something that we consider very seriously before we do it. And that's why it's important to know and consider all of the alternatives to guardianship first. And then on the next slide, we have a few of those alternatives. So let's talk a little bit about um, alternatives to guardianship. Probably the, the first one that you'll see is durable power of attorney. So again, this is not, this webinar isn't intended to provide you an in-depth understanding of all of the alternatives, but to spur some conversation. So, um, power of attorney basically gives um, a third party the ability to do business on your behalf. However, at the time of incapacitation, a power of attorney ceases to be in effect. A durable power of attorney remains in effect if an individual becomes incapacitated for whatever reason. So, uh, durable power of attorneys remain in place. Um, sometimes people seek guardianship perhaps because of money issues, and, and technically that's really more of a conservatorship, um, but uh, sometimes those things can be addressed simply by approaching Social Security uh, to become representative payee of someone else's, of the individual's benefit to help them kind of manage that money. The, the Social Security benefit would come to the representative payee on behalf of the individual. Living wills, so sometimes uh, guardianship is sought because there are medical conditions that are, in, that are, that are of concern and perhaps uh, because of uh, a terminal medical condition. So living will, um, do not resuscitate, they, they go by lots of different names. Um, but perhaps something like that could be explored without having to um, take that official step of seeking a guardianship. Um, a trust, uh, a lot of times trusts have to do with resources and they have to do with assets. Uh, so guardianship may be sought so that an individual's assets or someone else's assets do not cause, uh, do not affect them. So a trust would allow homes, vehicles, uh, insurance beneficiaries to be placed uh, in, an, in an official legal trust, which would be um, available to the individual, but they wouldn't be considered an asset, and consequently the individual might not run the risk of then losing their benefit, especially Medicaid, uh, which would then could affect their ability to participate in our waiver. Um, another one is community supports. You know, have we explored all of those 
other community supports, community agencies that may be disability specific or may be available to the general public to support the individual um, in some way without having to fully terminate their rights. And the last one is supported decision making. And uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time just talking specifically about supported decision making because of the initiatives that have taken place recently in the state. Uh, and that, um, you know, the, the division, the department has um, committed quite a bit of resources towards uh, educating the public as well as the courts and making some revisions to the uh, guardianship um, laws um, to support uh, or to encourage uh, the exploration of supported decision making. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and let her give us uh, kind of a, a brief overview of what that is. Yeah, the governor actually signed a, a bill into, into 2018 that specifically stated that supported decision making was to be considered uh, before guardianship. And it's also in the petition that is sent to the court for every guardianship. There's a sentence in there that says you know, somewhere that there's no less intrusive alternatives to guardianship available to provide for respondents care and financial needs. So that's kind of why we're uh, explaining supported decision making a little bit more here because of the importance of it. But it is an alternative to guardianship if you're not sure exactly what it is. A simple way to explain it is that we all use it. Uh, in my early 20s, I probably used it quite a bit, what I call my parents, and ask them a million questions about life and finances and everything else. Uh, so it's not like it's something that we all don't use. So the, them using it is just the same as anybody else. We all do it. Uh, it promotes self-determination, control, and autonomy. Again, it gives them the ability to, to keep quite a few of their decision-making powers and their rights. It fosters independence. Uh, supporters are selected by the person with the disability, so they get to pick the people that uh, do these things for them. Obviously, we make sure that these people are willing and able to do it, but if they are, then the, the client gets to pick who does this. And then the individuals and supporters execute a supported decision-making agreement. So it's something that they would all sit down and agree to. Everybody would know their role and what they're doing. And as a viable means to provide people with disabilities, the opportunity to keep their decision-making rights. Like I said, just a minute ago, it is a way for them to, to stay independent or as, or as independent as possible. Great. And there are other resources related to more specific resources related to supported decision making that are out on the website. And uh, most likely uh, we'll refer you back to those, especially if there are questions about it, try and get those resources in people's hands. So <laughs> here's the, the, the basics of, of the change to supported decision making. Uh, I mean, um, guardianship within the division. Basically, first and foremost, is that we have moved away from a regional um, model to a centralized statewide model. Um, referrals are going to be sent to the, guard, the email address you see listed below. They'll be um, filtered out to um, the information specialists and guardianship coordinators. Um, and questions for tech, you know, regarding the guardianship process. Um, or technical assistance can all be submitted there. Um, Stacy brought up a good point, uh, and we talked about it this morning, and unfortunately we didn't put it on a slide, but any current guardianships that are in process are going to be handled by the guardianship coordinator you're currently working with. So those may not be handled through the information specialist. It, it doesn't make sense to interject ourselves into a process that's already underway and just runs the risk of us missing something and ultimately the individual suffering because of it. So basically by attrition, um, anything new as of today will come in through the DD guardianship at dmh.mo.gov. But if you're currently working with a guardianship coordinator, 
um, and have already begun the process, then then we'll we'll continue. You know that process will continue until it's finalized, uh, just to avoid any um, mishandling of the situation and ultimately the individual suffering because of it. Um, Stacy, anything else that I missed? Uh, I see that we do have quite a few questions uh, in the chat box, and uh, I've just kind of been browsing them. Several of them are asking about uh, if they apply for legal aid, and legal aid says that they can't help. Um, what resources do they have? If if they have the need and they apply through legal aid, and legal aid denies for whatever reason, uh, typically it's they usually here they don't have the funds right now or something. Uh, they will send a denial letter, and then you can just tuck that denial letter in with your packet for your application for the DMH. Um, because obviously, if they have the need and they qualify and they have a financial need there, then you can apply through DMH. And when in doubt, ask. What are some other questions? I'm trying to pull up chat myself and see if we can answer them. Will DMH review less restrictive alternatives with the individual and seek out additional supporting information? So, will will we meet with that individual? No, we'll probably ask some questions, especially because they are part of the the legislation now that covers guardianship. We're gonna a, we're gonna ask you to um, kind of give some detail, um, specifically regarding. The, the the topic of supported decision making and that all other options have been explored and that this is the only option. Obviously, we understand that there are going to be individuals who require a guardian. Um, so we're not trying to to get away from that. Um, but we're just trying to remain congruent with um, what's what's already in existence, especially from a legislative standpoint um, or legal standpoint. Um, that we're we're remaining congruent with with all sides, and that we're ensuring that supported decision making and other less restrictive options have been explored, and are really not a feasible option for this individual. Yeah, I would add too, Matt. Um, if if somebody has not had the pleasure of filling out a guardianship packet yet. Um, it is pretty thorough and between the physicians interrogatories and the case managers statement uh, that's usually covered in there. I mean, if, if they answer it pretty detailed and don't just give some quick answers that that's all pretty much covered in in those 2 things. Right and again, we're not going to offer legal advice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, We're going to ask, you know, that you. You know that you respond to those questions in as much detail as you can, and then we'll allow general counsel to 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 give us the the thumbs up or the let's ask more questions. I will say just as a teaser that after the first of the year we will have a, a secondary webinar where uh, we're Stacy's going to actually do, present a webinar on how to put the packets together. Um, and how to do each page of that exhibit packet. And um, we feel like that'll be great information. Not that we don't wanna answer questions, we do. We wanna provide as much technical assistance as we can, but it'll have it in, in basically webinar form as well. So um, it'll help with some training, um, some training pieces. Any other questions that we're seeing? Uh, this is not a question, but somebody did put in here that uh, you could possibly try Catholic Legal Services. Apparently, they're helping one of their families right now. Okay, so there's another resource. And I'm not sure if, so let me add on to that before another question gets asked. I'm not sure if that's a statewide or if that's regionally based. Um, any other questions? Uh, asking about the average turnaround time from when a packet is submitted or a question to the email address, how long will it take for them to hear back? We, we like in a day or two, um, we, we try to have a pretty quick turnaround that it, once you refer it, uh, obviously if you refer it on a Friday, you know, we're gonna look at Monday or Tuesday. Um, 
But we would, I would like to see pretty quick, pretty quick turnaround, at least someone saying, hey, I've gotten it. Uh, we're taking a look at it and we're, we're in the process, uh, especially if it's a question. Um, I want our folks to, to reach out and say, I'm at least aware of it so that you know that we've got it. Okay. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. And then can we email questions to that email? I think we answered that. Yeah, most yes. definitely. Sure. And Just then how understanding someone... that we're not offering legal advice. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Depending on the question. Right. Depending on the question. You can ask any question, but we may say that's a question we might want to refer up the chain. So. And then uh, how is someone deemed eligible per what income guidelines? So this is not an eligibility ineligibility. This is just something that the division is able to do. So um, there isn't a, an income guideline or a checklist or a this or that. Um, that's ultimately just the, the support coordinator and the team indicating this is the need. And um, you know, we've, we've spoken pretty extensively with um, Denise Thomas and her team, and um, they feel comfortable that they can kind of vet those. Um, so uh, present the information, we'll submit it to, to them and ultimately let them make the final decision. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. And I think that's about all if we missed any. Yeah. We're gonna have a, a few more. Are there a, a few more? Can you I help us, Kat, and maybe? Sure. Um, can our consumers who can afford to pay for the guardianship process use our lawyers? I have many that cannot find a lawyer. Oh, boy. Okay, that's a great question, and that's something that I can't answer. Um, but it's something that we'll definitely research, and we will answer that on our Q&A, frequently asked questions. We will respond to that. Stacy, oh, that's a great one. So help me remember that. But we will, we will check that out, and we will provide a response. Great question. Give me one second. I think there's a few more. Okay. Well, we scheduled a lot of time. We knew that the presentation wouldn't go that long because the changes weren't going to be big. But we did want to build in a lot of time to ask questions because when things change. People have questions. While we wait, does anybody want to sing a little song or? <laughs> Don't tempt me. Don't tempt Stacy. Um. Okay, so what proof do we need to provide that other sources have been tried or not appropriate when asking for DMH to take on the case for guardianship? I'm not sure. So I'm going to throw out my thoughts. I'm going to have Stacy throw out her thoughts. Um, I think that the proof would come down to the support coordinator's statement, um, detailing out what. What's been ex what's been looked at, what's been considered, and and why those things aren't feasible? Stacy, what do you think? Well, typically, we just ask. It doesn't have to be a formal, like we don't need W twos and pay stubs or anything like that. But we just need to know, like where they work, what if if it's a family that's paying for it, uh, just like their major income and expenses to show the need. Um, and then if you applied somewhere else, then you would get a denial letter from legal aid or uh, they, they usually ask what the quotes were and from whom the quotes came for uh, local attorneys in the area. Like, you know, if you live here in Springfield, let's say you called, he doesn't do it, but Aaron Sachs, everybody knows him. <laughs> yeah, Aaron Sachs said it was gonna cost $2,500 and we don't have that and here's why, so. And that, and I think probably adding on to that, that we've maybe the team has looked at supported decision making. They've looked at some other options that just aren't feasible and, and kind of a, and a discussion of why they're not feasible, why it's not an option. So 
why there's a financial need and, and why guardianship is basically being requested overall and what you've looked at. Is SDM a written contract? Is SDM? Is that right? Yeah, the supported decision making doesn't uh, need to be in a written contract. They have a formal there. So some of the materials I think that are out on the website do provide and um, some of the national uh, groups that that talk about supported decision making do have a formal agreement, I guess, a contract. Do you have to have that? I know. Um, because it's it's a it's an informal process, but has formal um, you know outcomes where someone is supporting that individual, but but there it doesn't require like a, both parties enter into a contractual agreement. They're out there. You can look at them. I've I've seen them, um, but they're not mandated. How does HIPAA apply when completing guardianship packet? An individual cannot sign that the release is needed to gather information needed in the packet. That's a great question, and that's going to be something that we're going to have to run up the you know run up flagpole and get some information, and then give it back to you because I would hate to shoot from the hip and give wrong information today. But it's a great question. Where is the supporting decision making agreement located? So I have seen it on um, there's a supported decision making website. So we will put that in the um, in our Q and A frequently asked questions. Uh, we'll link it to um, to that website. Uh, but there's a I, I don't want to use the wrong term, but there's almost like a national consortium of supported decision making and so we'll get that linked and it it has examples of agreements but we'll make sure that we get all of that in the in the frequently asked questions can a sdm request services for an individual or provide information so a supported decision maker is what i'm going to assume um, so unless you are Unless they have a durable power of attorney, then affording to the division, they could not make decisions on behalf of the individual. If the individual retains their rights and they do not have a durable power of attorney in place, then no, they could not. And I'm trying not to offer legal advice, so I, I, I'm just, I'm basically giving you my understanding of from when I worked in intake, and that was the, the protocol that they could not make, they could not request services and they could not make official decisions unless, uh, as, and if the individual was of the age of majority, okay, so ab above 18 or older, uh, if they retained their rights and did not have a durable power of attorney, or, uh, you know, someone that was like a mom or a dad who had a release could get information, but they could not make final decisions. Can you send out the guardianship packet as I know it was updated? So, yes, we will um, figure out where what we would like to do is, is have a place on the website where some of our documents are located. Here's going to be my caution, my cautionary statement to the packet is I think sometimes people want to run and get that packet completed without first talking with a guardianship coordinator and getting that on the radar. So my, my cautionary statement is this, I wouldn't encourage that. I'd start the process by making a referral, reaching out through the email and allowing us to give you the packet, not because it's proprietary or we're trying to conceal anything, but because once you get that doctor's signature, you have six months and things get busy, okay? And so you may get that going and get the doctor and they sign off, they move on it, but not everything's together and you could have a two or three month delay. That doctor's signature starts your clock. And so by the time it comes to us, maybe you've only got three months left. So my preference would be to say, reach out to us. Let's talk through the process. 
uh, let, let us support you and then move forward with getting you the packet um, so that we don't run the risk of, of running outside our timelines. We have uh, someone that says they just want to clarify. We send the completed packet to you, correct? What is the criteria for the packet to move forward after you receive it? So, when Stacey, why don't you talk through that process a little bit? Because you've done that. Yeah. Um, when it's submitted, I look through it first of all to make sure there's no errors or you know if anything's been omitted, and uh, we'll communicate back and forth to get it completed properly. And then once it's it's completed, I send it on up to uh, Assistant General Counsel, and then it goes through a process where they look at the doctor's interrogatories and sort you know just kind of look at me the medical need to make sure that this person definitely qualifies and needs a guardian or conservator. And then um, basically that's about the only step that there is after it's submitted to assistant general counsel is just to make sure that there's a need there. And then um, the financial need is there as well. You've probably answered this, but I'm gonna go ahead. Um, can DMH help a family member obtain guardianship if they cannot afford it and are denied by legal aid? So yeah, always you just submit it and we'll we'll work through the process. When did I ask? I see a question on here that says, does someone from this email group file with the courts or is it the responsibility of the family or case manager? And I think I kind of touched on that just a second ago when I uh, mentioned that we're the ones that send this to assistant general counsel and then they draw up the petition and then they send it to the court. Um. I have only received denial from an intake and referral from legal aid. I have not been provided. It says no letter for assistance for a guardian co guardianship. So, my recommendation would be because that's not there's there's some questions I have there. Go ahead and submit that question with a little bit more detail. Um, to the, to the email address and let's see what we can do to help you on that on an individual basis. Can you remind us which professionals will fill out the interrogatory? So, Stacy. Yeah, um, the important thing to remember, because I think that the most that I've gotten have tendency to be nurse practitioners or physician's assistants because doctors are very busy and they have these people do them things for them. So if those come in as a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, we uh, cannot accept those. It has to be somebody that has a doctorate degree. So it has to be like a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a physician, a neurologist, somebody with a doctorate that's in that, you know, line of work somewhere in there. And I, I will say, um, like at the first of the year, we will plan on having a pretty in depth webinar, um, like bring a snack and a drink. And Stacy's going to walk through all the the forms and we may bring in a couple of the um, guardianship coordinators to to not have Stacy do all of it by herself. Oh yeah, because it's super exciting material too. <laughs> we have some that are their own guardians, even though they should not be. What can we do in those situations? These particular people also have no family to assume the role nor assist with removal of guardianship suggestion. So that is something that you could submit to the guardianship and, and basically we would approach general counsel about it, assistant general counsel. That would be us not making, giving legal advice um, and um, making sure that, that everything is copacetic, you know, in, in those terms. So instead of providing a, this is how we would handle it, in general terms, submit the question and the situation to the email address and we'll submit it to um, general counsel for their input. And then we'll, we'll provide that back to you. 
this question kind of links back to that. If someone has questions regarding packets, do they email the new email or can they reach out to someone regionally? Okay, so if you've already started the process on the regional basis and you've already been working on the packets, you're gonna to continue to work with that individual. If it's a new request as of today, then go ahead and submit questions through the email address. So if you've already started and you're already working on a packet, then stay with that guardianship coordinator. Are you asking that they send the entire packet to that email? Yes, when, well, what will happen is when you typically get assigned to, um, uh, to work with an individual through the information specialist guardianship coordinator, you'll work with them directly, okay? So, so typically you'll you'll work very closely with that guardianship coordinator and they can submit the pack you can submit the packet directly to them. But if you have questions and maybe you don't remember and you want to submit it, you can. When in doubt, send an email through that through that email address. I would rather be inundated with emails than never get any. If the family can't afford guardianship with denial from legal aid, how does DMH fund payment of a lawyer? The UR process, I am assume, I am presuming. No, this does not go through utilization review. So if 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 the individual is requesting assistance through the general counsel, you would just reach out to us, and we'll take we'll we'll begin the process from there. But no, it does not go through utilization review. It's a great question though. Terrific question. Okay, SDM should be individualized, whether written or oral. Internet forms are helpful, but not required if you are formalizing an SDM agreement in writing and are using a form, you should modify the form to suit the individual particular the individual's particular needs and wishes. So it's kind of not a question, but a statement. Okay. Well, we appreciate whoever put that in. Um, does someone from this email group file with the courts or is it the responsibility of the family or case manager? Okay. So Stacy's already answered this. Um, the general counsel will file with the courts. Once everything's in order and, and they've given final approval, they will file it with the courts. Is DMH able to help families apply for alternatives that are still legally binding, like durable power of attorney, living will, or is it only for guardianship? At this point in time, Stacy. Well, most uh, things like power of attorney isn't something that has to be filed to the court. That's just something that you sign in front of a notary and that becomes a legal document. Um, so we didn't have anything to do with that. If they don't sign the SDM agreement, do we just mention in the plan that they are the SDM? Do we need individual to sign release for the SDM each year? So that's really up to the individual and the team. So if the individual wants their supported decision maker to have um, information about their plan and participate in their meetings, then then yeah, it would be just like any other, think of it like an advocate, that they would have attend their plans and be able to get information. They, they just wouldn't have the ability to make a decision. I think when we put an official name on it, we kind of get nervous about it, but it's basically an advocate or a friend, someone that's supporting that individual. And we would follow the product protocols and policies that we have for anybody else. Is there a pre-screening form we could have completed prior to speaking to the guardianship email? Uh, not right now. Um, 
just it would just be something that you could send out, send to, uh, you know, some thoughts and questions, and and this is what we're needing and we're asking for, and then work closely with the individual that it would be assigned to. Um, we have a case manager asking, can they get can they get their part filled out before they send it to the doctors? Stacy. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter what order you fill things out. I mean, because we ask that the packet be sent once it's complete. So if you just keep that and get your part filled out while you're waiting on the doctors, because sometimes that takes a little bit for them to get those back. But uh, just hold on to everything until you have it all together and then send it as a completed packet. I, th I think it's probably related to, you know, the timeline that's starting of the clock, but the clock doesn't start until the doctor's signed. You can fill yours out. The case manager's portion has to be notarized as well. And so they go by the date that's on the, the notarization. So if you have yours filled out, you can just hold off on having it notarized. And then whenever you get your doctor's interrogatories, then you can have yours notarized. That way, you know, you have the dates as close as you can. Um, I have not been aware of a six month timeline. Is there an outline of all the details of submitting a packet in terms of timelines? There's going to be. <laughs> but it's six months. Yeah, it's, it's always been that the dates on the, that the interrogatories have been signed has to be within six months. If it's older than that, then it gets to court, then the court will say that these are too old and, you know, you'll have to go back to the beginning and get new ones from the doctors or the case managers, just have it notarized again. How do we utilize the information specialist in our office in this process? You don't, you send it to the guardianship coordinator email box. So the, the information specialists are housed in various re regional offices, but they serve the entire state. So, um, you know, my, my preference would be that if you have a question, send it to the email box. Okay. Because what I would like to avoid is someplace that might have a lot of guardianships. People are like, well, we're just going to go ask so and so. Well. And yeah, they're close and yeah, they're current, but they have other job responsibilities that they're addressing and I don't want them getting burdened down. I wanna be able to share the wealth, share the burden. Um, so my, I'm asking you not to do that. I'm asking you to um, send it through the, the email address so that we can make, we, we know who's working the case and we can make sure that the workload is evenly distributed. Is completion of the guardianship packet a billable targeted case management activity? I do not believe that it is billable, no. Um, because it is an adverse action ultimately and Medicaid will not reimburse based upon an adverse action. How long would you suggest starting the guardianship before 18 years of age? I am not going. <laughs> That feels like offering legal advice. I'll just say, um, start it. You know, I think, what do they say in school? Start your transition planning as soon as possible. Another is who is the department's notary? Uh, so I don't know that the, if how they have done that in the past, um. Uh, that'll be maybe a question we need to respond to during the FAQ. Question and answer. Matt, I'm assuming that that question has to do with uh, the, the case manager having to fill out their part and having right. it have to be uh, notarized. Right. And some OSAs are notaries and some aren't. aren't. So um, that's the last question I see. Perfect. Well, we want to thank you for participating. It's been a terrific turnout of almost 250 individuals. Um, I hope it's been helpful. 
Um, obviously, if you have questions, send it through the email and let us take a look at it and see how we can support you. Stacy, any closing thoughts? Um, no, just thanks to everybody who took the time to come in and see what we had changing.